when God put us together as human beings in the flesh of the human nature, he knew exactly what we needed to help us be attuned to spiritual matters. It's good to always remember that when we read the Bible and things are taught that we do and things we ought to leave undone, of course, but I'm thinking now particularly things that he ordains us to do. And we move that over to the actual worship of God. He is the one who knows how best we need to approach him in worship and how to do that. We're taught to worship God in spirit and in truth. Thus, we center our minds upon the one we worship, who is God, according to the teaching of the truth that's set out in his son's last will and testament. I would like to address you this morning for a little while on one of those acts of worship that is to be done on the first day of every week in the assemblies of worship of the Lord's church. We just finished a Memorial Day. Memorial Day was actually first declared by Mr. Logan back in 1868, although there had been sporadic type things like that even during the Civil War, but it was primarily called for by him to remember all of those who had died in the Civil War. It was known at that time as Decoration Day. And by 1890, all of the states had accepted that day as a memorial day to all those who had died. I will remember my grandparents referring to it as Decoration Day. I still remember a number of people at that time in the country areas where they would actually go out to the cemeteries, clean them up, make sure that there were flowers on the graves, and to those who had died, they would usually put flags. And thus, my grandparents, mothers, mom and daddy, referred to it as Decoration Day. It was in memory of them. It was at uh, one time the last day of, of May. It was moved in 1971 to as it is now, the last Monday of the month of May. We need things to help us remember. That's the point I'm making. I have here, and I'm sure you do at home, different things, maybe a dried flower from a funeral. I still have a dried flower that came from my great-grandfather's casket, and it's in one of my big thick history books because that was the thickest I had at that time to put it in. It's still there right where I put it, even stained the page a little bit. There are a number of things, pictures. People used to, they don't do it much anymore, would take a lock of hair or somebody and keep it. That was a common practice. So many things. We need help. To remember. I have here something that's important to me. There are several other things too. These are my daddy's dog tags. He wore them all the time he was in the service through North Africa into Italy. And the old saying is if they could talk. But I have something else here that's important. In fact, he has two of them. This is the only one that has a metal cover. the New Testament and it has on this metal cover may this comfort and protect you it has on the inside of it his name Sergeant James R. Brown has his number and has all of where he, what he was a part of and his nearest relative who was my grandfather at that time where they were Here's what's interesting. It's not going to happen nowadays. But the first flyleaf in here says, the White House, Washington. As Commander-in-Chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces of the United States 
Throughout the centuries, men of many faiths and diverse origins have found in the sacred book words of wisdom, counsel, and inspiration. It is a fountain of strength and now, as always, an aid in attaining the highest aspirations of the human soul. Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now I think even in reading that, it makes you realize the importance of a memorial. Something to help us call to mind that which is past, but was a fact of history. It makes us remember certain things. We, we do this even when we sing songs. I noticed several songs that he chose this morning sort of fits this because it had to do with the death of Christ, suffering of Christ. And I want to talk to you then about the Lord's Supper as one of the five acts of worship God's ordained the church to engage in to make a complete worship to God by the church on the first day of the week. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 22. And I want us to begin reading In verse 16, he's just observed with the apostles the Passover because there's still Jews on earth and he's not died yet and the law is still the way the Jews approach God. And out of that Passover, he institutes the Lord's Supper. And he says, and I'll start in verse 15, and he says to them, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you, before I suffer. The sentence continues. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat, therefore, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now remember the latter part of that verse. <coughs> then he says in verse 18, For I say unto you, I will not drink in the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Now keep that in mind too. Those two verses are important. And then he says, And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Thus you hear us call it a memorial feast. Verse 20, likewise also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now you can read the rest of the accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see that, but that sets out the point that we want to make to begin with. Paul would write to the Corinthians, Christians. He preached the gospel to them. They believed it and from the heart obeyed it. And they were added to the church by the Lord himself. And he taught them how to worship God. He taught them that was their responsibility. And part of the blessedness of being a child of God to be able to acceptably worship him. But, you can see how quickly things can be corrupted. And the church at Corinth had corrupted the Lord's Supper. So he writes this letter, which will be part of the New Testament, of course, and it is, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to instruct them on a number of things that they were in error on. And he says this regarding the Lord's Supper. For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. That's interesting. I think we ought to remember that. He received of the Lord. He's an apostle. The Lord revealed it to him directly. Then, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. We just read about that. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. Then in like manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Point I'm emphasizing here is when the Lord instituted it and when Paul is correcting these brethren who had corrupted it, he still emphasizes it's done in remembrance of the Christ. A simple memorial feast. When people come in to services of faithful congregations of the Lord's people, They'll know on every Sunday in that worship, the Lord's Supper is observed. We'll say more about that in a moment. 
Now, you may go into a number of denominational churches built upon the foundations of men, the crumbling foundations of men. And they may partake of it monthly or quarterly or whatever. Basically, it's as it suits them, which is the reason denominations exist, because it suits them. So it's the memory of Christ as one of the acts of worship, as he has ordained us to remember him, memory of his death, that we engage in the supper. Now let me emphasize, because I am talking about this memorial feast, which is one of the acts of worship of the Lord's church on the first day of the week, does not mean that it is the most important act of worship. There's nothing in the New Testament that says it's the most important act of worship. It is simply one of five acts of worship. And the complete worship has not been obtained until each one of them have been engaged in. It would be somewhat comparable to the plan of salvation. One is not complied with the terms of pardon of the whole plan of salvation till each step has been taken then the whole thing's been accomplished. Thus, the worship of the Lord's church on the first day of the week is not complete till each act of worship has been carried out by the members in that assembly as the Lord teaches. But even in the church, people forget. We all tend to do things like we like to do them. We all tend to let our opinions and our likes and dislikes override the authority of God in the words of God. Of the Jews, Jeremiah, in the days just before Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians, said, can a virgin forget her ornaments or her or bride her attire? Now watch what he says. Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. That ties in some to what Isaiah said 100 years before that when he was telling them early on that they had disobeyed him so much they had now deserved punishment. And Jeremiah lived in those days when that punishment was coming from Babylon. I'm afraid that if Jesus lived today, he could quote Jeremiah concerning churches who claim to believe in Christ and claim him as Savior, claim the Bible, the Word of God, that they have forgotten about these things. The study of the authority of the Bible and how to ascertain that authority and the importance of it is just not on the top shelf nowadays. People really don't like doctrine. I speak in generalities, of course. But doctrine means there's a way to live the doctrine of Christ. There's a certain way to live. There are certain things to be done. There are certain things not to be done. We sing a song sometimes, let him have his way with thee. Well, I'm afraid that's something that gets violated quite often. Because after all, we like our way to be done. In 1 Corinthians 11, 26, we see that this memorial is preaching, as I read, Christ's death. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do proclaim or show forth the Lord's death till he come. Where is our mind to be as we partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine? On the Lord's death. Why? Why? Without that death, we have no remission of sins. We're lost and undone. There's nothing for us to do but look forward to a fearful meeting of the God who is a consuming fire. So we must realize that if our minds are where it ought to be, in memory of Christ, it's in memory of his death. We do show forth his death till he come. And thus we can see that that memorial feast was to be observed by the church until he come. Now, when is that going to be? 
I don't know. Nobody else does. If it's tomorrow, then we've done it today, or will have, if the Lord wills. Or if it's a thousand years from now, faithful Christians, as those two words are used in the New Testament, will have continued to do this. So we see then that the Lord's Supper is a silent witness of the tremendous sacrifice of which there's no greater of all the ages. And wherever it's observed in the east, the west, the north, the south, for those who know the book, the will of Christ, who dedicated their life to Christ and obedience to the gospel, then this will be something that will be on the minds of men in a very forceful way. And yet it's set out so simply. And you think about another memorial that gets noted, even though Memorial Day is the Unknown Soldier's Tomb in Washington. Have you ever noticed anything? You can see it sometimes on YouTube, how you're to be solemn and quiet and have a respectful attitude. And the guards that are there will let you know right quickly when you're being flippant and acting silly around that tomb in no uncertain terms. We who are the children of God, think of what that means. And have gathered together to worship on the first day of the week. It's no time for frivolity. We often pray, help our minds to be centered upon God and upon godly things in this worship. And so it should be. And it's also an excellent way to teach our children and train them how they should conduct themselves in the assembly. Oh, it's only been a few years, really, longer than I like to think. When our brethren, and they're meaning to do well, but not thinking about the authority of Christ in some way or the other, decided they would divide assemblies like this and put the young people over in some other room and have a divided assembly. Evidently, people just didn't think, does that suit God? What well, suited them, they wouldn't have done it. But does that suit God? Children learn not only by just teaching, they learn by experiencing. Now that's no <laughs> new thing to you, you know that. They need to learn how they ought to act in an assembly of God's people gathered before God to honor Him and to worship Him. And that's very important. Notice how it's a memorial also, not only to the death of Christ, but it's even a memorial to the second coming. We show forth his death till he come. It affirms in our mind that he is coming again. He won't be coming as the, as the lamb, but as the lion of the tribe of Judah. To judge the earth, it's too late to expect his mercy on that day. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Paul, of course, is virtually quoting Jesus when he instituted the supper, as we read a moment ago in Luke 22. So it's in a retrospective view, it's proclaiming his death, without which there'd be no forgiveness of sins. But there's a prospective view then, and that is, that he's coming again, and it's a weekly reminder of both in the worship assembly of the saints. It's a memorial which preaches the New Testament or the New Covenant of Jesus Christ. Paul also says in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians and verse 25, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. What makes the New Testament potent, powerful, effective? The fact that it is the blood that allowed it to come into existence. The blood of the New Testament. He gave his life. Life's in the blood. He shed his blood. So the cup, the symbol of Christ's blood, is simply the sign of the confirmation of a new covenant between God and man. 
We've already mentioned in passing, without showing why, that it's on the first day of the week that children of God assemble. And in that assembly, they worship God according through five acts, and one of them is the Lord's Supper. But how do we know the frequency of observing the Supper? Maybe some people would say, should there be any frequency or regularity in observing this part of the worship? Uh, how, how do we regulate it if it is? Who regulates it? Is it the church? Or does God regulate this worship item? Well, we have already acknowledged by obeying the gospel that Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth, that the New Testament is in his blood. It is where he expresses his will concerning how he saves a man when a man is saved and how we worship him. That's the whole purpose of the words of the Bible, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, is to educate us, to guide us, to enlighten us. It's where the authority of our king is manifested. So we want to understand that it's God that regulates, that authorizes through Christ these things. Now when I read of the early church in Jerusalem, the, the first church of our Lord, in Jerusalem. I know that it continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I know that because Luke of Inspiration wrote it and I can read it and understand it. Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Also in fellowship. Also in breaking of bread. Also in prayers. Now one thing this does, it indicates there was a regularity and frequency. And it wasn't just an occasional custom when they got ready to do it. And they understood that the apostles' doctrine was where the will of Christ was manifested in view of what the apostles were called to do by Christ. They are the ambassadors of the court of heaven. When they speak as the Holy Spirit guides them, they speak the will of Jesus. Early church knew that, and thus they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It also uh, evidences the frequency of its observance. Luke is writing this to Theophilus. And so he wants him to understand that very thing. In fact, right here, it is so understood if you knew Christians about what they did in the assembly on the first day of the week at that time, he doesn't go into details with it right here. But the frequency of it and the regularity of it is established in this verse. Then as Paul went out much later on to preach the gospel once the Gentiles had heard it, Acts 10 and 11. Gentiles came into the church same way anybody does. Obeying the gospel. Church in Antioch of Syria is established. And from them were sent out Paul and Barnabas. Later Paul and Silas. To preach the gospel to all these Gentiles. Paul being the apostle. Specifically selected as the apostle to the Gentiles. And we find out that the church at Troas came together. That's an assembly to come together. They convened in that assembly. And they did it on the first day of the week. And it says, for the purpose of breaking bread. I think most here know this, but breaking bread is just simply a term whereby you eat a meal. Well, when you take the totality of what the Bible says about the Lord's Supper, it's not sitting down to eat a meal for physical sustenance like we eat when there are various things we eat. But it is something to be eaten by the members of the church on the first day of the week in the assembly of the saints. And upon the first day of the week, American Center says, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul preached, or as the American Standard also says, discourse with him, intending to depart on the morrow. Now, Paul at this time, if you remember, was in a big hurry to get to Jerusalem. But he waited several days for the brethren to come together so he could see all of them. 
Now, he knew the faithful were going to come together on the first day of the week. Not the seventh day, not the third day, but the first day of the week. And that they did, and he was there. Now, to break bread simply means not a literal just taking bread and breaking it, but it meant partaking of the Lord's Supper, because even the Lord's Supper has more in it than just bread. It has the fruit of the vine. We've seen that already in the institution of it in Paul's writing to the Corinthians and correcting them on their mistakes. So from this verse, Acts 20 and 7, we see that they're taking it on that day is an approved precedent. An apostle was present. He had taught them how to do this. And he waited on them till they would come together on that day, and it was to break bread. Now, I think that's a synecdoche that stands for the totality of worship. But even if it doesn't stand for the totality of worship of the church on the first day of the week, it stands for the whole of the Lord's Supper. Now, if it had been wrong, the apostle wouldn't have participated in it. He would have condemned it and straightened them out on it, even as he did riding the church of Corinth. They came together on that day. They assembled on that day, the first day of the week. And since the Lord's death is the center of everything there is about us regarding salvation from sin, for he purchased the church with his blood, we're baptized into his death where he shed his blood and so on, then it came to stand for that worship. And there's but one first day of the week and every week. And even if you don't know Greek, you know that when he said do it on the first day of the week and every time the first day of the week rolls around, what do you do? You do what he said do on the first day of the week. Now, I don't mind telling you, I don't know why they did it this way, but the Greek actually says upon the first day of every week. But I don't have to know that. Because he said, what's being done here, we're talking about the Lord's Supper, is to be done on the first day of the week. Now, how many first day of the weeks are there? Well, there's this one we're on right now. If time goes on, will there be another one? Yeah. What are we to do on that day? What well, the Lord said we're to do on that day as Christians. So we need to understand, and people who come and visit our services need to grasp why we partake of the Lord's Supper in the worship assembly of the saints on the first day of the week. I hope if you've listened, now you know. He told the Jews under the law of Moses, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That was the seventh day of the week. Every time the seventh day rolled around, that was a Sabbath, and whatever the law taught them and how they conduct themselves on that day, they did. Now, if they could know that, we can know that every time the first day of the week rolls around, God has told us through His Son by the inspired writers what we're to do on that first day of the week. So we have an example. There are many accounts of actions of the early church that aren't examples for us from the standpoint they must be done. But what is necessary, the observance of the Lord's Supper, is what must be done. And that's what they did. That's the reason it's the apostolic example, a pattern to be followed. It must be admitted that the meeting together upon the first day of the week and those Christians breaking bread in that assembly establishes the frequency of the Lord's Supper. And those who separate the breaking of bread upon the first day of the week from the meeting together upon the first day of the week, have no authority so to do. Now, I want to challenge you with something to think about this. Everything you read of in the New Testament, if you don't believe me, just read it. <laughs> Concerning the observance of the Lord's Supper is in the worship assembly of a congregation on the first day of the week. You can't decide to go out here to the creek bank and say we'll take the Lord's Supper with us and observe it. You can't say, well, I'm closer to my family than anybody else in that whole church, even though I'm close to them. We'll just stay home this week and worship. Can't do that. Why can't I do that? My Lord has not authorized such action on my part or your part. He's authorized each congregation to assemble together. Remember, a scripturally organized, fully organized congregation is elders, deacons, teachers, preachers, members. 
in each congregation in any particular geographic location, fully organized, has elders to shepherd it. Those elders are going to see that the church does what the Lord tells them to do, what the chief shepherd tells them to do. That's part of their job. I've seen all my life, I don't know how much it's done nowadays, because for some reason people got the idea of the Lord's Supper is the most important part. I've seen them come in the services, take the Lord's Supper and leave. Well, they didn't worship God acceptably. They sinned when they did it. Need to repent of it. Or else somebody's got to take a trip and they can't be in the worship that day. So they observe the Lord's Supper at home. That's all they do. They didn't worship God in spirit and truth. They didn't respect His authority. As I say again, I challenge you simply to read your Lord's will for your life when it comes to worship. And you'll see that everything said about the Lord's Supper has to do with observance within the bona fide assemblies of a local congregation. Just the way it is. No so ands or buts about it. And we must respect that. The church of Corinth, as I've said several times already, corrupted the Lord's Supper. They actually turned it into a meal. Some were hungry and others were actually drunken. Paul said this, When therefore ye assemble yourselves together, or come together, as the King James says, it's not possible, American Standard, to eat the Lord's Supper. Well, they called it the Lord's Supper, but they had corrupted it, and when they corrupted it, it ceased to be the Lord's Supper. You can call something an act of worship. If it's not authorized by the New Testament, it's not an act of worship. I don't care what you call it. That's sort of like the old thing goes when you have a dog and how many legs does the dog have? Well, he has four. But what if you call his tail a leg? How many does he have? Well, he still has four because his tail's not a leg. The brethren have not learned that when it comes to the church. They'll call something that. And they, well, we called it that, and that's all right. Upon that kind of thinking, if you can call it thinking, the whole denominational world plunges to perdition. Same you can't get them to come out of it because they won't respect the authority of the Lord or learn how the Bible authorizes or how we're to ascertain it and have the proper respect for a king. Oh, they can out loud say, oh, King Jesus, King of King and Lord of Lords. A lot of good that does. We can go ahead and do things like we want to. Notice in this verse, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty. I think it's quite evident from this verse that it was their practice to attempt to eat the Lord's Supper when they assembled. That's what they thought they were doing. And though they corrupted, they were attempting to do it. And if there was any regularity about their meeting together, there was also regularity about their eating the Lord's Supper. So here's the regularity about their meeting together. Upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by him in store as he may prosper, that no collection be made when I come. Take that verse concerning the church assembling, regarding giving of our means, and put it together with the first day of the week in which the people assembled. It's quite obvious then, the first day of the week was a time in which the church was appointed to come together to assemble and in that assembly, do certain things in worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So it's no wonder then that we're taught in the Hebrews epistle, Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The exhortation that is there is not for us to go out to brethren who miss the services and say, we exhort you to be in the services. It's not what's said there. What's said there is by being in the services with the right frame of mind, every act of worship exhorts you to be godly the rest of the week. And that's how the worship of God according to the Father's will through the Son exhorts us. It's even as instructed in Ephesians 5.19 regarding singing. We not only learn that we're to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and to make melody in our heart, but we're teaching one another, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual song. So while we're worshiping God in song, we're edifying one another. 
That also serves as is the Lord's Supper, done in memory of Him, in prospect of His coming. Strengthen us for the battle ahead. Simple memorial. But forsake that, you lose that. Now let me say something again about daily Bible reading or praying. Will you vow to yourself right now that between now and next week, you'll read your Bible every day? I'm not going to ask you to speak up, of course. Well, why won't you? It's your Father speaking to you. It's how God tells you to live. It reminds you. The second epistle, I beloved, I now write unto you, in which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. It's a memorial. It helps us stay on top of things. But I promise you, you get so busy with the affairs that are going to be burned up someday that you'll forget to read your Bible. A child of God forgetting to listen to his father speak. So I'm telling you, when we get kind of hard on those people at Corinth about corrupting the Lord's Supper, we better think about ourselves as to how often and how much time we spend with the Word of God and in prayer. We always need something to exhort us. And one of the acts or all of the acts of worship on the first day of the week serve to encourage us to pray and study the Bible. Well, who's supposed to participate in this? Well, I'm going to close with that. Christians. Now, we don't tell people in this assembly that only those who are a member of the Spring Church of Christ or the Church of Christ can partake of the Lord's Supper. It's a free will thing. We pass it by because the Lord plainly says that we're to take note of ourselves. That we're to make sure that we observe the supper in the proper manner. Self-examination is taught. And if a person who's not a member of the church chooses to partake of it, that's their business. We don't have any authority from God to say you can't do it. But I do have authority from God to tell you that he only authorizes a faithful member of the church to do it. You must make up your mind. Are you a true member of the Lord's church? A Christian, as that term is used in the scriptures. You must make up your mind to do that. If you were to ask me, not being a member of the Lord's church, should I take the Lord's Supper? I will tell you no. Because you're not a Christian. How can you remember the Lord's death when he died for you when you won't even obey the gospel? You won't even be baptized into his death where his blood was shed. And you certainly are not hastening to look for the Lord's coming because if you're not one of his then, that's a horrible thing to think about. Although it should move us to prepare while we can. So we must choose on the basis of of the truth, the rightly divided Word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15 and Colossians 3.17, that we act and partake of this according to whether we're qualified to partake of it. Who's qualified to partake of the Lord's Supper? Christians. Now I've got to ask myself the question, am I a Christian? Such as Paul was, such as Timothy was, such as Luke was, am I a Christian? One who's of Christ a member of the blood-bought body of Christ, the church, the kingdom of heaven. Only those are the ones who take the Lord's Supper. In fact, bring it over to every act of worship. Will God receive the worship of non-Christians when they sing? Especially when they sing songs about, give me the Bible. When the Bible's been given, they have it and they won't do what he says. What about prayer? You expect God to hear your prayer? How can you say father? He's not your father if you haven't obeyed the gospel and you're one of his children. And so on on every act of worship. Every act of worship is for the faithful member of the church. God is not going to receive the worship of people who aren't faithful and who are not members of the church. He will not do it. He only receives the worship of those who are faithful to him in the church as they walk under the authority of Christ. We can think however we want to think about it, but the Lord's already thought about it. More than that, he's revealed his thoughts. 
And they are authoritative. And we must abide by them. So I simply close with some more questions we can answer about the Lord's Supper, but this sets out the basics of it. In the assembly of the saints on the first day of the week is one of the acts of worship. And for Christians who are serving God according to His will in the church, of course, that's where they are. For the Lord added them to the church. Thus we close the lesson on the Lord's Supper, a simple memorial feast that shows forth His death till He comes and also remind us that He is coming. Do you need to obey the gospel? Are you outside of Christ? In a moment, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. If you're outside of Christ, you might eat the bread and you might drink the fruit of the vine. It won't do you any good. In fact, you're unqualified to do so. Now, how's the Lord going to look at that? You don't have the right to do it. You're not authorized to do it. Now, if you're a child of God and you've sinned, you need to put those sins away in repentance and confess them and pray God for forgiveness. Whatever we do in word or in deed, let it be by the authority of our Lord that we can have full assurance that we can know we are right. I don't mean to be puffed up, but to know you're right with your God because you've loved Him and kept His commandments. If you're subject to the invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.